A few years ago, in 2014, I was working excessively long hours and started to feel super burned out. Eventually, I decided I needed somewhat of a sea change and, for some unknown freaking reason, decided Moscow was a good place to head. So after arranging a teaching position over there and selling a lot of my crap in my home country, I headed over at the end of August. The first six months went by without any incident. Well, there were a lot of incidents, actually, but they're all just funny anecdotes that I'd get sidetracked on, one being a huge bender with the Hells Angels Moscow chapter. You're here for the juicy crap, though. It was a Saturday in mid-March of 2015 and still pretty cold out. I'd finished up my afternoon class and was on my way to meet a friend at a bar slash club near the Pushkinskia metro station. We had a few beers and were talking in English, he's Russian, though, and as day quickly turned to night in our boozy stupor, all of a sudden we had three guys sitting on the couches surrounding us. They sparked up a conversation in English, asking a few questions about where I was from and how long I'd been in Moscow. Standard crap, really. They seemed like nice enough dudes, and my Russian mate didn't seem to have any issues with them so we were accommodating. Soon, we were all enjoying shots of top quality beluga vodka their bottle end as one empty turned to two, then three, and four, I can safely say I was completely rat freaked. I woke up very dusty the following morning, hazily remembering the previous night's shenanigans and promising myself I'd never drink that much vodka again. Then, later that evening, I got an SMS from a number that I'd apparently saved in my phone named Anton, saying something along the lines of, How are you, man? How do you feel? I replied something standard, You feel like crap, etc., and he eventually asked me to join them out that night at the same place. I kindly refused as I had a morning class of kids to teach the next day, and that was that. Thursday was the next time I heard from Anton, again asking me to join them at the bar for some drinks. This time I agreed, as I didn't actually have any classes on Friday, and invited my friend along too. Again, hit the vodka hard. Again, they shouted all night. Again, I woke up like crap. But this time I woke up and had already received a message from Anton. Keep in mind, I'm paraphrasing all of these communications as it was a few years ago now. Anyway, the message said, come to meet us at insert bar name today, meaning Friday. I replied telling him I couldn't drink as I had my class on Saturday and heard nothing back. It's a bit weird, but okay. Saturday afternoon, I was gathering my stuff to leave the school I taught at and had another message. Come to meet us at insert bar name today. I remember it being worded exactly the same as the last message. Not sure why, but I did. Anyway, I thought, yeah, why not? It's Saturday and I have nothing better to do. Freak it. Why not? When I got there, it was just Anton, so he and I got a beer and were chilling out talking crap. But then out of the freaking blue, he said, so you drink our vodka, but you don't pay crap? Just like that. No precursor, nothing. Weird. We'd been joking around just moments before. I asked him what he meant. You know what I mean, you creep, he responded. I told him I'd be happy to shout in shots, and that they had just been feeding them to me the entire time the past nights we'd been out. I never actually asked for them. Anyway, he said no, not enough. You drink say $5,000 of our vodka, you need to pay us back. What the hell, dude? How did you calculate that? No vodka is worth that, I said. He replied, this bar vodka is expensive. I went to the bar and got the menu and checked it to confirm. Nope. There was no way I owed him that. I showed him and still he told me I owed him $5,000. I had crap all money at that stage. I'd spent most of what I'd saved before leaving and I was being paid peanuts at my teaching job. Oh, but you're from the country. You know people who have it. I said, nah, man, nobody would send me that much. Then he looked at me, just stared at me. For a while. It was awkward and super tense. And told me that if I didn't find the money to pay him, he'd kill me. What the hell? I didn't even know what to think. Why would I believe that? Who would do that? 
and this is a guy I'd have what I thought were fun nights out with. So much going through my head. Anyway, he called someone and they came up the stairs into the entrance and sat down and pulled out a gun. Anton again says I know the school you work at. I know your metro station. You don't pay and I will kill you. Sure, I'd shared some info, but I was naive to do so with someone who I didn't really know. They point outside to two cars, both completely blacked out windows, saying there are people in the cars that want my money. Is this real life? This sounds like a freaking joke. Is that even a real gun? I've never even seen a gun in real life, so how do I know? He makes another call. I look outside and watch a huge freaking guy get out of one of the cars and come up and into the bar. He doesn't speak any English, and I don't know what he's saying. I ask Anton if I can call my friend so he can speak to this guy and translate what's being said. It's okay, he says. So I call Dennis and hand over the phone. They talk for about five minutes, and when I talk to Dennis again, he sounded really freaking shaken up. Man, he says. You gotta freaking pay these guys. They are serious. It's a group of people who will freaking kill you if you don't pay them. What are you talking about, Dennis? I asked. Dude, it's the freaking Russian Mafia. I got off the phone and told them I would get them the money. I was shaking as I left and felt like I was going to burst into tears. I'm actually typing this and feeling a hot flush and anxiety. I was still shaking when I got back to my crafty flat. Still shaking when I called my mom and told her I needed $5,000 sent to me through Western Union. She of course wanted to know why and I didn't want to tell her but, clearly, there was something wrong. I ended up telling her and she was talking about calling the embassy and getting me on a plane out of there. I told her no, that I just needed to pay and that would be it. She did end up sending it to me and I paid Anton. I know not really an epic ending or anything, but to be told you're going to be killed when you're in a different country by probably the most dangerous people I in that country is a very, very scary experience. It all sounds a bit made up, but whatever. I know it happened. Not sure what proof I can provide, any ideas? Either way, Russian Mafia, let's most definitely never freaking meet again. I grew up in Massachusetts during the 70s. I lived on a relatively traffic-free street and there were always kids to play with so if we weren't at school, we were outside. You came home when you heard your mom calling for you but other than that you were exploring the woods and going on adventures. My brother who was six years older than me would occasionally let me hang out with his friends but for the most part one spent my time with my best friend. There was an old yellow barn that was at the top of the street. It always looked abandoned and my friend and I always wanted to sneak inside and check it out. Both our mothers were very adamant that we were not allowed to go near the barn but never gave us a reason. During the summer we were eight years old and we were bored. We had already ridden our bikes three miles down the road to get ice cream and spent time feeding the ducks. It was while we were riding back to our street I mentioned that I really wanted to take a look in the barn and see what was in it. Michelle was less adventurous than me and was afraid we would get in trouble. I finally managed to convince her to come with me. So right around dusk we went behind the barn and found a very small window that was level with the ground. I was really tiny for my age and knew I could squeeze in it and then find a way to open the door for my friend. So with her pushing me from behind and holding my legs I finally got into the barn. It was dark and had a really nasty, dank, musty smell. I felt my way along the walls until I found the stairs and went up the main floor. It was much lighter in there and I was able to open the door for Michelle. As soon as she got in she was ready to leave, but I wanted to do some exploring so I made her stay with me. It was pretty much a big open room. To the left were the stairs that I came up from the basement and to the right were another set of stairs that lead to a loft. In the big room, there were tools and chains hanging on one of the walls, plastic bags scattered around, and a chair that was sitting in the corner. Nothing else was in the big room. So we made our way up to the loft. There were shelves that had an assortment of stuff like canned food, empty beer cans, and liquor bottles, 
porn magazines, and a few random boxes. I figured it was a hangout for the older teenage boys in the neighborhood so I wasn't too scared. I opened up one of the boxes and it contained bullets. I opened up another small box and in it was a handgun. I thought it was the coolest thing, not worried about why it was there or what it could be used for. By now Michelle was freaking out and totally scared because it was much darker and she wanted to go home. She finally had enough and told me she was leaving. I said I would be coming in a few minutes, I just wanted to look around to see if there were any more treasures to find. To this day, I never really found that little voice of reason that would tell me I was making a bad decision. I heard the door slam shut as she left and continued looking at the contents of the other boxes. The larger boxes contained clothes, wallets, and what I know now to be IDs. I heard the door slam again and was just about to call out to Michelle because I thought she decided to come back when I heard male voices. They didn't sound like boys the same age as my brother but much deeper and raspy. I was able to find a little alcove in the bookcases and move a box in front of it so I could hide. Not going to lie, I was scared. I heard them come up and one of them grabbed the box of bullets and the handgun. He went back downstairs and I heard them talking some more but I didn't really know what they were saying. You could hear a bit of scuffling and what sounded like muffled noise but I had no way to figure out what they were saying or doing from my hiding place. By now I am terrified and trying to figure out how I was going to get out of the alcove without being seen. What I didn't know was Michelle saw the two men pull up and go into the barn. She ran to get my brother and told him where I was and that I was trapped. He went and got a few of his friends and they started to pretend to play hide and seek behind the barn, making noise about splitting up into teams and such. Once the two guys hear that my brother and his friends, they went out back and started to yell at them about it being private property and told them they had to leave. The boys kept the conversation going with them asking if they could stay because it was a great place to hide and by now the men are getting really angry and threatening them. In the middle of the back and forth between the two, I heard my brother yell out my name and scream go. As quietly as I could, I went down the stairs. When I got to the main room, I could see what looked like a big trash bag in the corner. I was wiggling around and I was so scared I almost screamed out loud. I finally managed to quickly go out the front door and make it to the side. I met up with my brother and his crew and we started to walk away from the barn. One of the men looked directly at my brother and said, Step foot on this property again and you will never leave it alive. Some of the boys laughed, but my brother nodded his head seriously and said he wouldn't trespass ever again. It was pretty quiet as we made our way down the now dark street. You could hear some of the parents calling out for their kids to come home. We could hear our mother call out our names, so we separated from the group. I gave Michelle a big hug and swore her to secrecy about what we did. My brother threatened us with severe punishment if we even looked at the barn again. Not to worry. I learned my lesson. He said that he had heard from hushed conversations between our parents that they knew stuff was going on in the barn, but they never mentioned any more to either of us. So years go by and we are all now in our 40s and Whitey Bulger is in the news. People were coming out of the woodwork with stories of his heyday. My brother calls me and asks me if I heard about what happened in our town. He went on to tell me that they found five bodies buried in the old barn that used to be at the top of our street. It was a hideout for his family where they tortured, killed, and buried associates. Had there been a light in the basement of the barn when I went in I may have witnessed seeing them firsthand. I can't tell you how grateful I am that I don't have to live with that sight. And that wiggling garbage bag that I saw when I was on the way out? That may have been one of the deceased they found? I will never know for sure, but it is possible that I could have been trapped in the loft while they executed a man. I asked my father for details, but even to this day he was not forthcoming. Only to tell me that back then it was very bad for your health if you got in the middle of what was going on up there, so it was best to keep your mouth shut and your eyes closed. So that was the summer when I met the Mafia in Massachusetts. In the heart of Little Italy, New York City, where the aroma of freshly baked pizzas and the sound of Italian chatter filled the air, there was a man who lived in the shadows. His name was Vincenzo Moretti, 
a notorious figure in the Italian underworld. He was known for his ruthless nature and his ability to make anyone disappear without a trace. His presence alone was enough to send shivers down the spine of even the most hardened criminals. One evening, I was walking home from work when I noticed a dark figure lurking in the alleyway. At first, I thought it was just a trick of the light, but as I got closer, I realized it was Vincenzo Moretti himself. My heart raced as I tried to walk past him without drawing attention to myself, but he had already spotted me. Hey, you, he called out in a thick Italian accent. Come here. I froze in my tracks, unsure of what to do. I had heard stories about Vincenzo and his gang, and I knew that crossing him could mean certain death. Are you deaf or something? He growled, stepping closer to me. I said come here. I reluctantly approached him, my legs trembling with fear. He towered over me, his dark eyes piercing into my soul. What's your name? He demanded. John, I stammered. Well, John, I have a job for you, he said, his voice low and menacing. There's a man I need you to take care of. You do this for me, and I'll make sure you're well taken care of. I knew I had no choice but to agree. Vincenzo Moretti was not someone you said no to. He handed me a photograph of the man he wanted me to eliminate and gave me detailed instructions on how to carry out the hit. As I walked away, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I could feel Vincenzo's eyes on me, burning into the back of my head. I knew that if I didn't carry out the hit, I would be the one who ended up dead. That night, I lay awake in bed, my mind racing with thoughts of what I had agreed to do. I had never killed anyone before, and the thought of taking another person's life filled me with dread. But I also knew that if I didn't go through with it, I would be signing my own death warrant. The next day, I set out to find the man Vincenzo had asked me to kill. I followed him for days, waiting for the perfect opportunity to strike. Finally, I saw my chance. He was walking alone down a deserted street, and I knew that this was my moment. I crept up behind him, my heart pounding in my chest. I raised the gun and took aim, my hands shaking with fear. I closed my eyes and pulled the trigger. But nothing happened. I opened my eyes in confusion, only to see the man standing in front of me, a smirk on his face. Looks like you're not cut out for this line of work, he said, before turning and walking away. I stood there in shock, unable to comprehend what had just happened. It was then that I realized that the man I had been sent to kill was none other than Vincenzo Moretti himself. He had set me up, knowing that I would never be able to go through with it. I knew that I had to get out of New York before Vincenzo's men came looking for me. I packed my bags and left town, never looking back. To this day, I still live in fear of Vincenzo Moretti and the Italian mob. I know that one day, they will come for me, and I will have no choice but to face the consequences of my actions. But until then, I will continue to live in the shadows, always looking over my shoulder, knowing that the shadow of the Sicilian will never be far behind.